I am a clinical psychologist. I um, actually I'm originally from Rochester, which is nice. I recently just moved back. Um, I started my graduate training at the University of Rochester um, and then went to the University of Nebraska Lincoln where I got my doctorate in clinical psych and then did um, fellowship training in Chicago at a um, what I would consider is kind of one of the main mood disorders programs in the country for pediatric bipolar disorder at the University of Illinois at Chicago and it's just a outstanding place. Um, they have a wonderful website um, there and lots of information on their website about pediatric mood disorders um, and uh, then eventually made my way back to Rochester. So currently, although I'm a clinical psychologist, I'm not in private practice, though I get lots of requests to do it. Um, but I do do research in social cognition um, and kind of information processing in kids with bipolar disorder. Um, and I've been doing that now for about 10 years. My research started in schizophrenia and I've kind of moved to the bipolar disorder realm. So I'll talk today about some of my work in social cognition and when we talk about social cognition, just sort of how we interact and get along with other people and understand what another person's thinking or feeling or pick up on social cues. And I think about this in relation to bipolar disorder because it's really at the forefront or a core feature of bipolar disorder, particularly pediatric bipolar disorder, but not listed in the diagnostic criteria for it, but often something that parents um, and families and patients comment on and, and something that sh is deserving of more attention and getting more and more attention um, recently. So I'll talk, but interrupt me. This isn't like a formal talk. I have lots of slides um, that I've put together. Um, now, many of you know what pediatric bipolar disorder is. Some of you don't know as clearly. I won't spend a lot of time on the diagnostic, just a few slides on it. Um, and then a kind of burgeoning area in both clinical and research in the area of pediatric bipolar disorder is that these kids do show a lot of neurocognitive difficulties, not just in manic episodes, but after they're remitted and stabilized. These are lingering cognitive difficulties that they show that tend to get worse over time. So when we follow them from the time shortly after they're first diagnosed, and we do a kind of a neuropsychological assessment, and we follow them over time, it actually, you see a, a wider and wider gap between where children should be and where these kids are. Um, and we think there's multiple things that are, that are going on with that. And so closely tied to kind of, I call it straight ahead cognition, like attention, concentration, problem solving, executive functioning, is social cognition, interacting with others. You need the regular cognitive skills to be successful socially. If you can't attend to somebody, if you're distractible, if you're impulsive, of course that's going to affect how you interact with other people. So I study them both and I'll talk about a little bit what we know about social cognition difficulties in these kids um, and where the research is going and how that might relate to better psychosocial interventions, which is my goal ultimately to come up with. So, um, and everybody knows who's either worked with bipolar children or had a bipolar child that it's really mood instability, um, rapid mood swings, of course, va vacillating between mania and depression, but that's sort of too simplistic. When we look at kids, we see a lot of impulsivity, hypersensitivity to criticism. And boy, oh boy, if I could say what was the common denominator in the kids that I see clinically when I used to do clinical work, and now in terms of a research context, it is such sensitivity to criticism and such a need to be liked and accepted, but having such a difficult time 
being accepted oftentimes socially um, and making friends and so I see such a struggle with that so that if I could bold that part sensitivity to criticism difficulty with interpersonal functioning then of course the core features like rapid speech you also see difficulty focusing okay so of course like there's a huge debate and this is ongoing I was just at the International Conference for Bipolar Disorders in Pittsburgh and where years ago you, you didn't hear much about pediatric bipolar disorder. Now there's huge breakout sessions on it and workshops, which is good, but that's the good part. The bad part is there's a lot of disagreement in terms of how to define manic symptoms in kids. And is it really mania? Isn't it mania? Um, but, but we know that these kids tend to show a lot more rapid cycling, um, that um, s rapid switches or cycling from mania to depression occur more frequently. You see a lot of mixed episodes or mania and depression happening at the same time. Irritability, really very common, um, and a lot of, I call like ADHD-like symptoms. Um, hyperactivity, impulsivity, inattention, even if they don't meet formal diagnostic criteria for ADHD, you still see an ADHD-like flavor to these kids. Um, and huge comorbidity, I see a lot of anxiety disorders in it. Um, the data indicates that, or do you see that coming in? Yes. And I see a lot of PDD symptoms, spectrum, sometimes you'll get a comorbid diagnosis, pervasive developmental disorder, and sometimes it's not enough for a comorbid diagnosis of some kind of developmental, pervasive developmental disorder, but I'll see features like sensory integration difficulties, hypersensitivity to um, external stimuli, just a lot of, again, the communication difficulties or interacting with other people and social skills difficulties. And so there's just, I see, feature is very common in, in this group, but people don't talk about it as much. Um, it's becoming, at least with people who specialize in bipolar disorder, we're recognizing it. I don't know how much general practitioners are um, as much. Of course, there's still huge controversy. Co comorbidities and even the diagnosis still even. No, I, I tend to treat the First, absolutely. It becomes really clear that there's anxiety or there's a PDD. Yep. And that's actually the, the guidelines that have been developed to, to treat the, those core mood symptoms first, the mood lability, and see what's left over. Get the mood stabilized first, and then treat the inattention or the anxiety or whatever. And if you do it the other way, you can get a manic episode or, or whatever. So, but how many do it? I mean, you probably see a ton of kids that come in that have been treated by a million other physicians. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, they do. They do. So, um, I don't treat. I'm not a, um, but I hear about it all the time. Um, and I refer my patients and research subjects to, to good clinicians. So you have to give me your cards. Um, okay, so when I talk about bipolar, I think about um, especially um, just bipolar disorder in general, mood lability, kind of like this is a great visual. Up and down moods, right? Kind of ADHD. When you think about kids, you think irritability. Even in adults, there's irritability, but even more so in kids. And if you think treating adults with bipolar disorder is difficult, that's kind of the picture in kids. This sort of ADHD-like symptoms, mood lability, um, difficulties with attention, and it's, it's complex to tease apart all the different symptoms um, for parents and for clinicians both. And this is just, um, you can find this online, you can find this in any DSM. It's just a criteria. Um, for bipolar disorder, so I won't talk about this in detail, but what I will say is there's some controversy or some of the skeptics who argue against bipolar disorder in kids.